So your land is now my land. And I think we're reaching a point where Russia has had enough. We are moving towards a future of complete decoupling. Putin no longer trusts the West and this move confirms everything. Russia takes control of a big farming company backed by a US firm. Putin signed a decree to transfer away assets from companies in unfriendly countries and Agroterra is the latest casualty of this law. The holdings of the company are now under the direct management of Russia. And this is not the first time Putin has seized control of a Western company. Now, just last year, they took away the Russian assets of Danone and Carlsberg. So this is nothing new. The company was given to people close to President Putin. And this will only continue the longer this conflict drags out, especially when the Russian assets are held captive in Europe. What's interesting is the company itself. Agroterra is one of the top commercial farmers in Russia. They operate 19 elevators and 24 farms in Russia. Now, the term elevator simply means a storage facility for grain. It's just a storage silo. By transferring the ownership away, Russia is taking the land back. The land is cultivated and it's located just east of Ukraine, quite near the capital of Kiev. Its fertile land and commodities like grain and soybeans are grown there. So this confiscation is quite different from other retail brands. It's a clear sign that Russia is ring-fencing all their vital industries. And there's nothing more important than the production of wheat and grain. Food production is perhaps even more important than oil exports. And it's key to reflect on what Putin is pushing for. He wants to create a grain exchange for the BRICS bloc, an exchange where the producers control the pricing of grain and wheat. He wants to wrestle back the power from the Western financial system. And that includes, of course, pricing exports away from the dollar as well. So this confiscation gives us a clue about his intention. Putin could be moving to consolidate the entire agricultural production under Russian control. His economic strategy is quite simple. Produce more commodities that the world simply can't live without. And food production is a big arena of power. The cost of growing food in the US is simply too high. There are farmers' protests in Europe as well. It's perfect timing to grow the Russian agricultural industry. In 2023, Russia exported an incredible $43 billion worth of food to the world. It's a lot of money from an export that everyone needs. So agriculture is a big revenue driver for Moscow. Grain and wheat are commodities that have inelastic demand. And this means there will always be demand for food. You can forgo everything in life, but you still need to put food on the table. There's no way to argue against this fact. Putin knows this and he's going to focus on growing grain production even more. This will make it even harder for the West to sanction the Russian economy. Consider the future of wheat exports in Europe. Over the next few years, Russia's exports to the world are going to stay near 50 million tons annually. It's not going to drop down. Conversely, exports from Europe aren't going to grow and those from Ukraine are expected to drop. By increasing production now, you'll grab a larger share of a vital market. Food is one commodity that's quite impossible to impose a global price cap. You'll spark a new food crisis. The cost of living around the world will rise. So this is one area where Putin is just going to focus on. When you control the commodities for survival, energy and food, your exports can't be blocked. It's not rocket science here. But let's circle back to the confiscation issue. Obviously, this isn't good for Russia-US relations. It's going to spark further mistrust and it shows Russia is serious about retaliation. We've heard it a thousand times now. The Kremlin has mentioned that Russia has their own confiscation list as well. If the West reaches in and uses the frozen $300 billion, it will trigger even more confiscations from Russia. So this spread of seizures isn't going to end. In fact, it's probably going to get much worse. As we speak, there are many calls from Europe to use the Russian assets. Olaf Scholz from Germany is supporting the idea to use the money to buy arms for Ukraine. And this could happen as soon as July after the G7 summit. So the outcome going forward is a complete decoupling between Russia and the West. It's not just Putin that's taking control of assets. Germany has done the same thing as well. Germany has extended their trusteeship of Rosneft's German assets for another six months. They are forcing Russia to sell off their refinery or lose it completely. Berlin took effective control of Rosneft's German assets, including its 54% stake in Berlin's PCK refinery in September 2022. So Putin's decree last year is likely a response to this. It's the classic tit-for-tat strategy. 
And going forward, I don't think Russia will continue to invest in the West. Just like the frozen reserves, you have no idea what action can be taken. And the longer this war drags on, the greater the desperation will be. And this could end in the entire 300 billion getting taken away and Russia seizing more Western companies. Many people within the US and Europe understand the danger of seizing Russia's money. I need to mention this. It's a very risky move. It will backfire and it kind of gives Russia cover to take control of even more Western assets. Even the New York Times published an article cautioning against this. Everyone wants to seize Russia's money. It's a terrible idea. And I want us to focus on one single point. Retaining the advantages of a reserve currency depends on our behavior as a trustworthy and neutral custodian of others' assets. If we start stealing people's money, that could change. The author is of course referring to the advantage the dollar brings, the ability to borrow money at cheaper rates and finance US government spending. And all that could end in a hurry if the West crosses the line. It's estimated that the West has $288 billion in direct investment stuck in Russia. And that is a lot of money that could face retaliation from Putin. But regardless of what happens, I think the future is abundantly clear. Future investments from Russia will flow to China and the other BRICS countries. The last place will be the US or Europe. Russia will also be uninvestable for the West. But let's shift gears a bit and talk about Russia's war budget. Because it seems despite all the sanctions going on, money is still flowing into the war chest. And this presents a big problem for the West. It reflects a big underestimation of the Russian economy and the global demand for crude oil. Russia's revenue jumps in the first quarter as oil prices rise. And there are many reasons why earnings are rising despite the sanctions. The OPEC production cuts are working. Ukraine's refinery attacks are working. They're causing a lot of supply problems. China's industrial pivot is also preventing a collapse in crude demand. And all this contributes to a high oil price. Russia gets to tax their producers more, and this means the war could continue indefinitely. The keyword here is indefinitely. They won't run out of money. If we analyze the wartime budget income, two things stand out. The first is the oil and gas income. This year's numbers are in blue. Last year is in grey, while 2022 is in orange. And what do we see? Oil and gas income is at pre-war levels. It has almost doubled from last year. The sanctions aren't working because the global oil market is dynamic. There will always be demand. There will always be buyers outside of the West, especially if they can get a good deal from Putin. The last thing the world needs is another inflation crisis. So Russian oil will keep flowing out. Meanwhile, Russia's non-oil revenue is growing. It has increased by over 40% versus the previous year. And this includes wheat exports, industrial metals, and chemicals. This amount is more than oil and gas, which should be quite shocking to everyone. Like Saudi Arabia, Russia knows the risk of relying on only fossil fuels. They are growing other parts of their economy and diversifying their industries as well. So what does this mean? Simply put, the Russian economy isn't going to collapse tomorrow. Whether you hate or you like Moscow, these are the numbers, guys. The world is still buying a lot of Russian exports. Which is why Europe is starting to worry. Trump might be back in office. The $60 billion from America isn't coming soon either. The burden will be placed on Europe to fight a never-ending war. And if we look at the disparity in defense spending, the EU has a lot of catching up to do. Just take France and Germany. Their defense spending is only at 1.6% of GDP, when NATO's target is a minimum of 2%. Their adversary, Russia, is spending 4.4% of their economy on the military. There's simply no choice but to play the catch-up game and it's going to be a very expensive game. To catch up with the Russians, the G7 and friends who have to spend at least $10 trillion over the next decade. And where is this money going to come from? The US can't afford to subsidize the entire of NATO. Getting $60 billion to Ukraine is hard enough. There's so much deadlock in Congress. $10 trillion to Europe will be impossible. Congress will never ever pass this. So the EU will have to fund this black hole with borrowed money. Now I'm not saying they will, but if fighting Russia is their priority, fiscal spending is going to explode in Europe. We'll have yet another inflation problem coming down the road, except this time it could be triggered not by the US, but by the EU. But let's end this with Lavrov's trip to Beijing. And this is quite important because it comes on the back of Janet Yellen's visit. 
You know, that infamous visit where she went around scolding China of overcapacity and went around threatening Chinese banks. It's important to say that Putin will be visiting China in May as well. So Lavrov is there to talk with the Chinese, to lay the groundwork for Putin's visit and more importantly, to secure the economic alliance with China. And it's very important to pay attention to the pomp and pageantry. President Xi met with Lavrov, which shows this is a very important meeting, at least more important than Janet Yellen's visit to Guangzhou. We mentioned previously how Yellen made a big mistake by threatening Chinese banks over Russian trade. It will only drive Moscow and Beijing even closer together, which is exactly what happened. Lavrov jumped on the chance to remind China of the West that the US is impeding China's economic growth and Chinese technology, which is why I fail to understand why Yellen went to China to scold China. It doesn't make any strategic sense. You just drive your adversaries together. And by now, we know why Russia needs China. They need imports from Beijing. They need the Chinese Yuan and a strong demand for Russian energy. And these are the things that the Russian economy absolutely needs. But let's talk more about why China needs Russia. Moscow is the biggest oil supplier to Beijing. Exports have overtaken Saudi Arabia in 2023. China imported over 107 million tons of crude from Putin or around 20% of their total demand. What's important here is both the security of the supply as well as the discount China is enjoying. For China's big industrial pivot, they need a supply of cheap energy that's secure, which is why Russia is just so important. Over the past few months, we have seen the US and Europe pressure China to manufacture less, to stop exporting deflation to the world. And that's why Yellen went to China warning them of overcapacity. She even threatened sanctions on Chinese banks that aid Russia's war effort. But here's why it simply won't work. As long as China remains the world's factory and the biggest exporter, they have a big shield. Yellen can't sanction Chinese banks without destroying the dollar and hurting the entire world. She will have to break the entire global supply chain. China is the top trading partner to over 120 countries, and this includes US allies like Japan and South Korea. Just last year alone, China gathered they earned a trade surplus of $820 billion. So they export more to the world than they import in. If the US were to cut China away from using the dollar, this would cause pain and misery to every country trading with China. Suddenly, you can't use your dollars to buy stuff from China. What does this do? It lowers the effectiveness of the dollar itself. And because of this trade leverage, China can persuade countries to use local currencies to buy their imports. The demand for the Chinese Yuan will go up and the usefulness of the dollar will suddenly collapse. And this in effect de-dollarizes the entire world at once. But it can only happen if China remains a strong manufacturing power. That's why China needs Russia as well. Manufacturing runs on cheap energy inputs, which is what Putin has. It's a big reason why the West wants China to decouple with Russia. That way, Beijing's industrial pivot becomes shaky. Their manufacturing growth will be built on a house of cards and is vulnerable to US sanctions. So China's economic future is tied very closely to the fate of Russia as well, to a very large degree. So once we understand this, the economic war becomes much clearer. China and Russia can't decouple without risking their own individual economies. China's foreign minister confirms this as well. According to Wang Yi, China will support Russia's stable development under the leadership of Vladimir Putin. And he's not saying this for fun or to placate Moscow. China knows their big pivot depends on good relations with the Russians. And the only way to defend against Western sanctions is to build an even bigger manufacturing base. So don't expect China and Russia to break away. At this point in time, it's impossible. Their cooperation is existential for both their countries' survival. Yellen's recent trip to Guangzhou is a big reminder of this reality, of this whole situation. But let me know what you think. Will Russia start seizing even more assets from the West? And can Europe raise $10 trillion to fight the Russians? Let me know in the comments below. Stay safe, be sure to smash the like button and subscribe as we navigate through these crazy times.